Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to talk about PID. This is a simple method of implementing a closed loop control that can be done in either software on a microcontroller, like an Arduino, or in hardware with some op amps. Let's dive in. Closed loop control is awesome. It abstracts the control process, so we don't need to worry so much about all the details of controlling. All we need to worry about is implementing a sensor that can accurately measure the thing that we want to control, and then ensure that the control system is stable when you combine the compensator and the plant. The plant is one key part of the control system, and this is a mathematical representation of the output stage and the system being controlled put together. For electromechanical systems, deriving the plant can get a little messy since we'll need to mash the electrical and mechanical engineering equations together. Thankfully, equations are still equations, and math is still math, so this feels more like dusting off something you haven't thought about in a while, and less like learning something completely new. For our ongoing UPS project, the plant is a combination of the electrical load and the output filter. For our project, we translated our circuit into the Laplace, or S domain, to derive our plant, and then we used that equation. This means that we're closing our control loop while considering the no load condition. Regardless, once we had this mathematical model of the plant, we pulled this into Simulink, or equivalent, in this case we used XCOS, which is bundled with Scilab. This environment has a continuous time systems palette, which includes a PID controller block. We can now tweak our compensator, which in this case is that PID controller, to achieve the performance we desire. This ends up being a balance between stability, margin, response time, overshoot, and ripple. Since we're using a PID controller, the levers that we have to pull are the P, I, and D parameters, or coefficients. Which brings us to the heart of our discussion. What exactly are the P, I, and D parameters? How are these three coefficients combined to make a control loop that regulates speed or voltage? What the heck am I supposed to do with this system in XCOS or Simulink to implement PID in a microcontroller? Wow, great questions, guys. Y'all are on fire today. Whatever's in your coffee, whatever's in your coffee this morning, I mean, keep hitting that stuff hard. I mean it. These questions are some that I wrestled with for a long time. Like, I was in my university, in my control systems classes, and don't get me wrong, I learned a lot about the theory, but there was a fundamental gap in my understanding. It's amazing how much a person can learn about control systems, stability, and control loops without getting down to the fundamentals of the situation. Then again, Maybe this was more of a I was hungry and lunch was after that class sort of thing. Regardless of who's truly at fault, it's a student's duty then and forever to blame all bad grades and gaps of knowledge on the professor that you ignored for 16 weeks. It seems fitting that the rest of this video should have a very different title. Everything I wish my professor would have told me about PID. Let's go. Everything in control systems is dependent on error. This error is fundamentally the difference between where you are and where you want to be. It's formally defined as the actual output subtracted from the reference output. If you're regulating speed, the error is the desired speed less the actual speed. If you're regulating voltage, the error is the desired voltage less the measured voltage. When we define error in this way, something critical happens. We establish negative feedback. This means that if the output voltage is larger than the reference voltage, the error is negative when we subtract. In other words, turn it down. If the output voltage is too low or lower than the reference voltage, the error is positive when we subtract, meaning that we need to turn it up. Remember that negative error means we have too much and positive error means we need more. Which brings us back to our PID block, which is not one thing, a PID D controller is not one thing. It is three things, and these three things are very easy to compute individually and then combine. A PID controller combines three simple equations by adding the three results together. Let's start with the P. This P block represents a very simple equation. Take the error that we just calculated by subtracting and multiply it by a constant. These, this results in a number that's proportional to the current error, or the error right now. The number that we multiply by defines how much we want our control system to respond to errors that are happening right now. This equation has a limited range that may or may not be the entire useful range of your output stage, and therefore when used alone does not guarantee that a system will ever reach its desired value. 
This is where the next block comes in, the i block. This again represents a simple equation. The i block is literally the integral of the error. Now this is kind of calculus and hand wavy, but it's nothing magical. It's literally an integral, and an integral can be complex, but conceptually it doesn't need to be. The integral is the sum of the area under the curve for a given waveform. Let me boil this down. If we need to integrate the error of a speed controller, the integral will have the unit revolution per second seconds, and therefore by adding up for every chunk of time how many revolution per second seconds there were forever, we'll get the integral. If we literally did this, the number coming out of our integrator would climb towards infinity forever, and that's why it's so important that we use the error instead of the raw value. This means that we're truly counting up how many revolutions per second above or below the set point seconds there are. If we're below the set point, the number that comes out of the integrator will continue to get larger until we aren't below the set point anymore. While we're at the set point, this number won't change, but if we're above the set point, the number that comes out of the integrator will get constantly smaller until we aren't above the set point anymore. If using an op amp, one would literally make an integrator circuit. This is a standard block that can be made with an op amp. If you're using a microcontroller, pick your favorite discrete time implementation of an integral and go to town. There are different discrete time integration equations that we can use to provide varying levels of complexity and accuracy, but it's still just a mathematical approximation of an integral. We're calculating the integral of this error and multiplying it by a constant to limit how quickly the integrator can push the control output around. Make sense? This is really harkening back to our first video about control systems, where we discussed the basic principle behind closed loop control. When we were talking then, and I stand behind it now, that typically we want to say that if the output is too low, turn it up. The third part of our PID controller is all about response time, but it comes along with some risk. The D block is also a simple equation, the derivative of the error. Again, also calculus, but doesn't need to be that scary. The derivative represents how fast a value is changing, and this can be done in hardware with a differentiator, or in software as a discrete time differentiation equation. This equation is truly dead simple. Take the current error, subtract the previous error, and divide by how much time has elapsed between then and now. The units here for our speed controller would be revolutions per second per second. Another way to say this is revolutions per second squared. For our voltage regulator, this would have the unit volts per second. There's only one danger here, and that's noise. Noise can really make a differentiator freak out because a differentiator is sensitive to the rate of change. The problem with noise is that we could see a spike with an incredible rate of change, 100, 1000 volts per second. But if this is a little transient spike having a short duration and no appreciable power, behind it, it just might not actually affect the system we're controlling, but cause our control loop to freak out. That noise may have been caused by a switch closing somewhere near the board or someone plugging in a connector, but as far as our system's concerned, it may as well have never happened. If the signal that a differentiator responds to is simply noise that wouldn't have truly affected the performance of our system, it could make our system seem to behave erratically by introducing oscillation into the controller for seemingly no reason at all just because noise is present. Therefore, when a differentiator is used, it's typically used after being filtered first to take out any noise. This filter averages out a few samples before passing it into the differentiator, which adds some phase shift to the signal but prevents responding to little bursts of noise in irrational ways. The best way to mitigate the instability that can be introduced by a differentiator is to make the coefficient zero if you don't need it, and this will simply make a PI controller out of a PID. We simply multiply the output of the differentiator by zero. While eliminating any concerns about the D term, this also makes the equation computationally lighter. This will free up some processing power that we can now use for a more accurate integration equation or other tasks the processor needs to do. Okay, so we have the basics of the PI and D block down, but here's where my mind really started to twist things, so stay with me. At this point, we add the outputs from the P equation, the I equation, and sometimes the D equation when we want to include that derivative term. This sum now creates a new value that represents how much we want to adjust the controller output. 
Conceptually, I think of this sum not directly as what we're going to set our actuator to, but rather how much we're going to modify where the control system currently is. We're deciding how much we need to add or subtract to the current control value. This happens kind of automatically where you don't really need to think about it for analog implementations with op amps since you're tying the negative feedback terminal around to keep it stable, but we need to kind of push the envelope with a software implementation. If, our, if we're doing this in software, our PI controller can look like this, a one-liner. The control output equals the P coefficient multiplied by the error right now, plus the I constant multiplied by this piece of the integral of the error, where this piece of the integral is the part of the integral that happened between the last time we were here and this time, or the control loop execution time. I typically default to a rectangular approximation with the integral, and takes the average of the last error value and this error value, and then multiplies by how much time has elapsed. It's not the most accurate approximation of an integral, but it's pretty computationally light, and it's usually accurate enough. We now add in the control output that we used the last time we were here. So we take the how much we want to push it around and add that to our last value. Hey, are, are you? Wake up. This is important. Our equation considers where we were and how different our output is to what we want it to be. It then decides how much to turn it up, take it down, or leave it be based on a little slice of the integral that just happened and the error that we measure right now multiplied by a constant with no knowledge of the past or future, hinting at the key takeaway. These P, I, and D blocks, these three pieces are combined for a reason. The P block is focused on the error right now. The I block considers the error over the past, and the D block attempts to predict the future based on the past error. And that's fundamentally why the D block is so risky. It's attempting to predict the future based on past performance, which is usually fine if something's behaving predictably, but sometimes things just don't go the way we expect them to when we're using the past to predict the future. There's only one more thing to consider, and that's anti-windup for our I block. Like we said, the I block adds up the past error over time forever. And that means that if the control loop is running while the output isn't enabled, for example, the I term will keep getting larger and larger forever. When we do eventually turn on the system, our output might shoot up to its maximum value until the I term comes back down to a reasonable level. That's not usually how a system should perform when first turned on. So I typically limit the output of the I block to what's physically achievable by the system. In this case, a value of one represents 100% duty cycle and zero represents 0% 0 duty cycle. So those are the limits I would typically use. However, for our UPS, we wanted to give our controller a little more leeway. And this is in case the output of the inverter becomes overloaded. We allowed a certain quantity of clipping in our voltage waveform, in this case 20%. This means that the output of the UPS will allow the output waveform to clip just a little bit if overloaded to increase the maximum power passed into the load. The alternative to allowing clipping would be allowing the output of the UPS to brown out, and clipping means that there will be some higher frequency harmonics that may come out of the inverter when overloaded, but it just might allow our connected device to hold on to its last dying breath just long enough to finish shutting down safely. I thought that it would be better to allow our sine wave to get a little rectangular, then pull the plug entirely due to a temporary overload condition. A PID controller isn't as complicated as I thought it was when I was studying in university. This is truly the combination of a scalar multiple, integral, and derivative to consider the current, past, and future expected performance of a system. We take this knowledge to decide whether our system needs to get more or less of whatever we're giving it to reach its desired value. Great stuff. We've uncovered the mystery behind the PID principles that power the control loop within our UPS and are ready to get things under control. Subscribe to be notified for future videos where we'll make great jokes like that one, design our DC to DC step up converter and discuss component level thermodynamics. I think that control loops are great and if you understand PID better than you did before, let me know by hitting the like button on this video or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone 
and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!